Well, it is good to be with you this weekend. I am so glad that I get to be back here. My wife and I have been traveling. We've been gone for a couple weeks. I want you to know we have more chigger bites and tick bites and mosquito bites than we've ever had in our lives. We got to travel back to Tennessee, to Georgia to visit family. And while the weather was amazing, 85 degrees with about 40% humidity, it was amazing. We're all doing this. You know, the girls have bites across their bellies and belt lines. I've got bites around my ankles. I am very glad to be back in the Arizona heat. It is a little hot. Today we continue in our sermon series called Upside Down. We are walking through the Sermon on the Mount. Yes, Jesus recorded. It's the longest recorded sermon of Jesus. We really believe that if we apply God's word to our lives, he will turn our lives upside down. He will transform our character. He will transform relationships, transform families, transform marriages but we have to be willing to apply his word to our lives. Otherwise, we're merely entertaining people. Otherwise, we're just having our ears tickled if we don't ask God to change us, to sharpen us, to grow us. And so we really believe that if we apply his word to our lives, it will turn our lives upside down. The passage of scripture we're going to look at today is found in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. If you do not have a Bible, I want to encourage you to reach underneath the seat in front of you, grab one of those Bibles and take that Bible home with you. We want you to have a copy of God's word that you can read, that you can understand. If you're in Parker, we want to encourage you to get up now, go to the back of the room, the center, the, the, there's a table in the center, grab one of those Bibles and take it home with you after you use it today for our sermon. Today we're going to wrestle and address probably the number one challenge that many of us as followers of Jesus struggle with, and that is judging other people. Whether we merely think judgmental thoughts towards others, whether we speak words of judgment, many of us, and including the pastors in this room, struggle with judging others. So if the passage of scripture steps on your toes, know that it stepped on my toes first. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. Let's read these words of Jesus. He said, Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye? But do not notice the log that is in your own eye. Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye. Then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Anybody feel convicted? First, I want to make sure that we understand what Jesus is talking about when he says, and he uses the word judging. Judging is the nitpicking of things that do not matter. It's nitpicking things that do not matter about other people. It can kind of look like my youngest daughter when she eats breakfast. If Jesse eats breakfast in the morning and she has scrambled eggs and maybe some sausage and some toast on her plate, if her toast touches her scrambled eggs, she won't eat her toast. That's nitpicking, right? It's all going into the same place. She's going to smash it with her mouth. She's going to swallow it with her swallower, whatever. <laughs> She's going to swallow it. It's all going to go in the same place. But if the eggs are touching the toast, she's not going to eat it. What is she doing? She's nitpicking. Eventually, she'll eat some of it, but she doesn't want to eat it if it touches the toast. That's nitpicking. And we nitpick other people. We judge them and nitpick them based on things that do not matter. We focus on their hairstyle. Uh, we focus on their clothing choices, on their speech patterns. 
We focus on other people's education level or their occupation or their former occupation or their family or their marriages or their past lives, whether they have too many tattoos or whether they don't have enough tattoos or whether they drink alcohol or whether they smoke. All of those things are nitpicking. Those things don't matter to God. Why should they matter to us? For those of us who claim to be a follower of Jesus, None of those things ultimately matter. And you might say, well, what do you mean their past lives do not matter? Well, I would say that to a certain extent, they do not. As a follower of Jesus, it is our number one responsibility to love God and to love others. And it is impossible to love others if we nitpick them. It's impossible to love others if we're always talking negatively about their hairstyle or their clothing choices or their relationships or their, the way that they speak or the way that they act or the way that they talk or what they like to do or what they enjoy. If we nitpick other people, it prevents us from really loving the people. What we end up doing is loving somebody that is not even there. We want them to become something else so much that we fail to love them in the present. In high school, I was a punk to some. I was a, a jerk to some. I had long hair, a nice mullet haircut, thanks to Billy Ray Cyrus being popular at the time. I had stripes on the side. I had bad acne. Uh, I rarely studied for tests. I did my homework if I felt like it. I was a straight B student without trying. One month after I gave my life to Jesus and became a follower of Christ, uh, uh, one month after, I gave, after high school, after I graduated from high school, I gave my life to Jesus. I began growing in my faith. And then about four years later, I began to have this desire to go back to college or go to college. Uh, I had been reading my Bible. I've been trying to live for Jesus. Uh, I didn't know where to start when it came to going to college. I had uh, been out of high school for four years. I scheduled an appointment with, with my high school guidance counselor and I explained to her that I, I, gave, I sat down across from her. I explained to her that I gave my life to Jesus right after high school, that I was now a Sunday school teacher. I'd been a youth volunteer. I'd served for one year as a church, plant, uh, church planter in Ohio. But now I needed some help getting into school. I knew I wanted to go, but I didn't have any idea of how to get that ball rolling. So I'm sitting there kind of bearing my soul to my guidance counselor, asking her for help. And she looked at me, but she only saw my past life. She did not see the new life that I had been living. She didn't see that I, even though I told her all those things, she wasn't willing to see that I was born again, that I was a new creation. She only saw the sophomore that came to school drunk in 1989 on moonshine. She didn't see the Sunday school teacher sitting before her. She only saw the guy that got kicked out of class for cheating on a test. She only saw my past and she politely said to me as she took off her glasses and set them down, Joe, some people aren't meant to go to college. Why would she say that? Because she couldn't let go of who I once was. She judged me in the present based on who I had been in the past. I don't remember what else she said because I tuned her out, but it was in that moment that I realized there are some people that will never let us get over our past. There are some people that will always judge us based on what we once did, maybe even based on our sin from yesterday. They don't judge us based on grace, based on mercy. They don't judge us based on who we are in Christ. They judge us based on who we once were. So let me hear from you, okay? Now, Christy doesn't like it. My wife doesn't like it when I do this. So just humor me. Raise your hand if you've ever called somebody an idiot if they cut you off in traffic. <laughs> now, by a show of hands, how many of you thought that the man on the corner with a sign asking for money would spend it on drugs, therefore you didn't do it? You didn't give him money? Yeah. Raise your hand if you've ever seen a child misbehaving in public and think their parent is too soft and ought to spank them. Right. 
we do that all the time. I'm guilty of those as well. We, we do that all the time. We see a behavior, we see an action, and we make a judgment based on what? Only on what we observe. And we make a judgment call. Now, I understand that I also need to be very careful to overcome my own deficit as well when it comes to judging other people because Jesus teaches us in verse 2 that I select my own jury. You see, if I'm nitpicking other people and if I'm judging other people, then I'm going to be a recipient of that as well. Jesus said, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the same measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So let's reflect a little bit today. Have you ever criticized somebody? Have you ever received criticism? Have you ever wondered why other people give you the elevator eyes when they see you? Maybe it's because you give them the elevator eyes when they see you or when they say that right. I think I said that right. Have you ever been gossiped about? Well, have you ever gossiped about others? Have you ever had lies told about you? Well, have you ever told lies about other people? Have you ever been limited to what the expectation, has somebody uh, ever limited their expectations towards you? They don't think that you're able to do something that you feel like you might be able to do, like go to college? Well, have you been guilty of limiting and holding other people back as well? I have. See, if I nitpick other people, other people are going to nitpick me. If I judge other people because of their appearance, other people are going to judge me based on my appearance. But if I love others, and this is where it gets exciting, right? So we understand that, that we're selecting our own jury. We're selecting our own journey to judge us, jury to judge us if we act that way. But get this, we also get to select our own jury if we're showing grace and mercy to other people. Other people are going to show us grace and mercy as well. If we show other people love and kindness and acceptance, then other people are going to show us love, kindness, and acceptance. If I allow the same grace to flow to others that I want to receive from Jesus, then I, I get to be a part of something that is a miraculous and amazing. Then I will receive grace and love from others instead of judgment. Raise your hand if you've ever felt judged by somebody else. Raise your hand if that happened in a church setting. And that just breaks my heart. Because the church should be about grace, right? The church should be about showing mercy and compassion. The church should be about showing love and accepting people where they are, hoping that Jesus shows up and changes their lives, but loving them even if he doesn't. Because that is what Jesus did. Jesus loved those prostitutes. He loved the tax collectors. He loved the notorious sinners. He shared hope with them. He shared grace with them. He shared truth with them. But he loved them and accepted them first. I've been there before. I've, been, I've felt judged by other people. By uh, Maybe I've been told to wear certain types of clothes as a pastor. Uh, I've been told to wear a tie. I've been told to wear a suit. I've been told to wear jeans or I wouldn't fit in with the younger crowd. Uh, I've been told how to trim my beard the correct way so that other people will like it. The very simple lesson that Jesus teaches us is found in Matthew 7 2, treat others how I want to be treated. It's a very simple practical step. We all know it. We all acknowledge it. But are we applying that simple truth to our lives? Do we really treat other people how we want to be treated? The sad reality for many of us is no, we don't. But we ought to. And we should want to. And we should ask God to help us treat others the way that we really want to be treated. It's a very simple, practical step. If we have asked Jesus to forgive us for our own arrogance and our own pride, our own selfish, sinful behavior, then as recipients of his grace, we ought to treat others with that same grace and that same kindness. It only makes sense. If we have been forgiven, we ought to give real forgiveness to others. If we have been shown mercy by God, we ought to show real mercy to other people. So, if we still have this judgmental attitude, what do we do with it? We, we're showing other people love and we're showing other people grace and we're showing other people mercy. What do we do with our judgmental attitude? Jesus answers us. 
And he tells us in Matthew 7, 3, and 4 that we need to be aware and remove our own blind spot. Be aware and remove our own blind spot. That's what we do. If we want to judge people, we judge ourselves. We want to redirect our judgmental attitude to the person in the mirror. And we need to sit down with a copy of God's word and say, God, change me into the person you want me to become. Uh, we rented a, a van last, last couple weeks in Georgia, driving around Georgia and Tennessee. In Atlanta area, the traffic is miserable. Everywhere you go, there's about 12 lanes of traffic sitting still most of the time. But when you are driving, it's crazy. Now, one of the features that I missed was a blind spot warning system. Okay, we rented a van without a blind spot warning system. And when I would shift lanes, I'm you know, looking around, I'm tr straining my neck, I'm spinning, I'm trying to see, I'm looking in the mirrors, trying to see. And for the most part, I did pretty well not cutting off anybody, but there were a couple times I got the one finger wave as I was driving through because I didn't have that blind spot warning system. On our minivan, if I put on my blinker to get in the next lane and somebody is there and they're in my blind spot, there's this little light that lights up in my dash. There's a sound that it makes on the mirror and it says, hey, dummy, don't go next, right? Don't go into the next lane. There, it's a blind spot. You can't see them, but guess who can see them? Everybody else around you, right? Everybody else. See, that's the thing about a blind spot. We are so close to ourselves, we can't see our own sin sometimes. We are so close to ourselves, we don't understand when we're judging other people. We may not see it as easily as somebody else might see it. But other people can. They see that sin in our lives from afar. We have a harder time seeing it but other people can see it clearly. It could be bitterness. It could be resentment. It could be unforgiveness. It could be an ambivalent attitude towards sin that you really just don't care whether or not you sin. It could be an unloving spirit. It could be a gruff and harsh tone with other people. It could be an addiction. It could be a lack of self-control. Let me ask you, are you aware of your own blind spot? Are you aware of that log that is in your own eye? What do you do about that? You, you've become a follower of Jesus. You've received forgiveness. You've received his grace. You've asked him to save you. You're, you're born again. You're made new. But you still wrestle sometimes with blind spots of sin. Listen to what Jesus said. He said, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? See, we ought to be our, our own harshest critic. Instead of judging others, we ought to judge ourselves. We ought to look at our, we ought to examine our own heart, our own motives, our own actions, our own lives. We should never ignore sin when it begins to take root in our lives. We ought to turn our nitpicking onto ourselves on a regular basis. We ought to sit down with a copy of God's word in prayer and say, God, nitpick me, change me, help me to become more like you. We should not fear being transparent and honest before God. God has already punished Jesus for every drop of sin that I have ever committed and will ever commit. God is not going to punish you over sin so you can be transparent and honest with him and be thankful for his grace and thankful for his kindness and thankful for his mercy. Now, you will, will experience God's wrath over sin if you've never really accepted Jesus as your savior, uh, if you've never become a follower of Christ, but we don't want you to experience that. We want you to have a growing, healthy relationship with God through Jesus. And it begins first by saying to God, God, I need you. I need you. I acknowledge that I am a sinner. I judge my own life. I, I acknowledge that I am a sinner and I am in need of you to save me. And you give him your life. And from that moment on, your sins are forgiven. From that moment on, you've been made new but we still get those blind spots of sin that creep up into our lives. So 
if I'm a liar and I sit down with God's word on a regular basis, then God's going to draw that out of me. He's going to help me to become more truthful. His character is going to rub off on me. If, if I'm a drunk, if I'm an addict, uh, if, I'm a, if, I, if I'm a whatever I am, if I'm going to sit down on a regular basis with a copy of God's word, God's character is going to rub off on me. He's going to gradually allow me to, be, to become more like him. And then the neat thing is, as God reveals those blind spots to me and I confess and remove them, then I can help other people who have been where I've been. Now look back at that passage of scripture. Uh, How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there's a log in your own eye? But then Jesus said, first, take the log out of your own eye. Then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. You do that in a non-judgmental way by going to your brother or your sister who have struggles, the same struggles that you've had and say, let me tell you how God rescued me. It's not in an attitude of judging them. It's not in a harsh criticism way. It's not in a way to make them feel bad. You get to go to other people and say, let me tell you about what my God did in my life. Let me tell you how God rescued me from that temptation. Let me tell you how God rescued me from that sin that was in my own life and how he set me free. Why do you do that? Because when you do that, you are helping others by celebrating your win. Number one, you're you're telling people, man, let me tell you what God rescued me from. You're, You're giving him praise. You're giving him glory. You're excited about what he's done and you're helping them. I love the story of the overcomer. I love the Rocky Balboa series and I love the I, I love the people that are constantly being put down by the world and that story of them rising up in victory. I love it. Many of you are that overcomer. Many of you have inspirational stories of what God has done in your life, how he has rescued you, how he has turned your life around, how he has given you a firm place to stand. And God desires that you help others remove that speck from their own eye by celebrating your victory, celebrating your win. You are that inspirational story that other people need to read. That marriage that God rescued and redeemed, somebody needs to hear about that because they're at the end of their rope right now and they don't think anybody else can relate to them. They need to hear your story. That addiction that God rescued you from, there's an addict sitting in our church this weekend that needs to hear about how God rescued you from your addiction. That cancer diagnosis, that depression, that anxiety, somebody needs to hear about your win. Why? Because we're inspired by the wins of others. We see that when God brings victory to other people, then maybe he can rescue me. I want to ask you this weekend that you would be willing to share your win. When you share your win, you share hope. When you share the story of how God has rescued you, you are building hope welling up inside somebody else. And they'll say, man, if God can rescue them, then God can rescue me. If God can heal them, he can heal me. Why? Because God is an impartial judge and God loves the world. You and I, and he wants to see everybody walking with him, redeemed, rescued. He wants to see your marriage healed. He wants to see that addict following him, cleansed and only addicted to Jesus. He wants to see us walk in victory and helping one another. When you share your struggle Those individuals understand that they are not alone because one of the things that sin does, sin makes us feel like we are all alone and isolated. 
And when you share your struggle about how God has given you victory, people realize they're not alone and there is hope. So consider getting involved with Celebrate Recovery. Man, if you, if you are an individual that has, has really been overwhelmed by life, the junk of life, and you feel like nobody else can relate to you, get involved with Celebrate Recovery. They meet weekly on the McCulloch campus. You're welcome to, to call the church office to get that schedule, that time. Man, it is an amazing thing for people to sit around talking about their stories with non-judgmental attitudes. And some are in the process of winning great victories. Other people are at the verge of winning great victories. And I think that we all are, uh, we all fall into that category. They celebrate their wins together. They stick with one another through issues and failures. Or maybe, maybe today you want to share your story with the church staff. You know, what we'd love to be able to do is we'd love to be able to, on a regular basis, share video testimony of how God has dramatically rescued your life. How God has brought you victory, how God removed that log out of your own eye. Why do we want to do that? Because we want to help others. And so if we can broadcast your story, whether it be sermons on a weekend, whether it be on social media, we do that so that we can strengthen one another because we are not in this world alone. We need to hear the stories of one another, good or bad, and see how God has rescued them and redeemed them because we all need God's presence rescuing us and redeeming us. So take out that prayer card. Give us, give us your name and say, I've got a story for you. Now, whether we do it or not, don't get upset with us if we don't record it, right? But we'd love to know. Tell us what God rescued you from. Tell us how God has given you victory. And drop that in one of the offering boxes in the back of the room. Or if you're in Parker, drop that in the offering box back there or McCulloch Campus. It'd be an amazing thing to hear the stories, to share the stories of what God has done. Consider how God has given you that second, third, and fourth chance in life and open your mouth and begin to speak. That is how we help our brother and sister remove the speck that's in their own eye. Let's pray together. God, we want to tell you, first of all, thank you. Thank you that you talk to us about judging other people and you, you bring a word of conviction about judging other people, but then you, you end it with hope that actually when we judge ourselves and we get to celebrate those wins and those victories, then we get to help other people. So Lord, help us to turn your grace inward first and help us, Father, to, to judge ourselves based off of your grace and mercy and help us to follow you fully wholeheartedly and as you rescue us as you deliver us help us to share our story of your greatness in our lives father we ask that you would uh, your holy spirit's presence would continue to work and change us into the men and women you've designed us to be we ask oh god that we would leave this place today with a less judgmental heart unless we direct it to ourselves Help us to love our neighbor as ourselves. Help us to treat others as we want to be treated. And help us to walk and live in that amazing grace in Jesus' name.